Applied Practice Activities Introduction Now you've reached the first lab section in Chapter 2, and I just want to give you a little overview about why we've included labs in here. Um, we want this to be a really applied practice uh, resource for you, and so it's one thing to read and reflect and be exposed to videos where other people are demonstrating skills or you see little cartoon characters demonstrating skills, but it's a whole different thing to then try out those skills yourself. And so over the next um, several chapters, we're going to pepper in lab activities that will pull on some of the themes in the chapters, but also introduce some really specific micro skills and techniques for you to work on. Um, some of you will be in a course and you may do this as part of your course, or you may do this with a colleague, um, pairing up to do some of these skills practice activities. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about as we head into this first lab is the dilemma that we're creating for ourselves in this by not really knowing our audience and by wanting to um, be inclusive of a wide range of diverse perspectives on counseling practice and counseling techniques. And at the same time, recognize that um, our audience youth as counselors or counseling students are going to be very diverse. So in some cases, we may have a white male counselor who gets paired up with a person of color or um, a queer person getting paired up with a cisgender person, or we may have two people who have very similar cultural identities paired up in this lab practice. Um, and we're trying in this ebook to not just give you the sort of traditional um, psychology and counseling skills and techniques approach, but also to introduce what might this um, particular way of being look like from an Indigenous perspective? Or how might a different worldview on health and healing impact the kinds of cultural metaphors that are drawn on for moving forward? Or um, how might land-based healing um, factor into how we position our understanding of the client's um, lived experience? And when we do that, that creates this dilemma around cultural appropriation because we want you to have the opportunity to be exposed to these diverse perspectives, these diverse practices, but we also want to find that um, careful balance of not um, inviting you to misuse or appropriate um, practices that are not suitable um, to the client that you're working with or for which you do not have a sense of cultural or training or invitational um, uh, ability um, to use those practices. Thanks, Sandra. I think of two terms. So cultural humility and, and cultural sensitivity. Um, and, and then Sandra, when, when you say not to, you know, culturally be careful about cultural appropriation, right? So what I see in terms of my work with clients is that, you know, I've got, I've got quite a few years of training, experiences, um, uh, learning as a, as a student, ISF and instructor and academic coordinator. Anyhow, through this journey, I've realized that I'm building this toolbox of kind of diverse tools. And when I'm sitting with a client and whereas you'll be sitting with your, your lab partners, um, um, what I find that uh, it's, and it's still a li lifelong journey for me is okay. In this moment with this particular client, what is it about the client's story that that strikes me? What is it in, in my toolbox um, that I've learned through the years that can be in the moment, be helpful to the client? For example, an, a, 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 a specific example, sometimes my clients have a hard time with the kind self-kindness and self-compassion. So some of the one of the interventions I may introduce, an, an idea, sorry, uh, sometimes I don't like the word interventions as much, but an idea, an experiment is um, being your own best friend, writing a letter uh, um, as a compassionate friend to yourself. What would you say to yourself in this difficult time? What are your strengths? How would you support this friend? Anyhow, in that in, in that moment, the client may say to me, oh, Gina, that's really helpful. I do love letter writing. I do like journaling. 
I'm a writer. And some clients may say to me, oh, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not a writer. I, that would make me nervous. So anyhow, then I can explore that. What is it about that process? What, what would be fitting instead? So, um, and going back to, in terms of working with racialized and, and, and um, maybe indigenous clients, um, and I, I think it's really important to, to use this, the cultural humility and the cultural sensitivity to explore what fits, might not, what, might, what might not fit, and using tentative and gentle language um, as well. So those are my thoughts. Thanks, Gina. And I think that's a great loop back to the idea of ethical care that we really highlight in this chapter and the client-centered practice that we're going to carry through the entire ebook. Um, and recognizing that what happens in therapy is about the person in front of you. Um, and so that careful attention to the relationship and to the things that are going to be a fit for them. And so, you know, there may be things that get introduced in this ebook that are not appropriate for you to practice together in your lab. Um, and you may decide that you really want to um, seek out supervision in a particular area because you think that this is a client population that you will work with. And so we're not actually expecting the lab to teach you everything and to give you a chance to practice with every um, client population, but to give you an opportunity to start to build your confidence in your skills and your techniques and your ability to approach those, those from a care-filled, client-centered perspective. Um, which then gives you the, the ability to go out and work with a wide diversity of clients. So be kind to each other and experiment um, and be care-filled and careful uh, in terms of uh, cultural appropriation.